Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm the founder of Mappy Hour. Really excited to have you join us tonight. Um, we are doing some skiing uphill, and that is my volume. I don't know if you could hear that. But um, tonight is part of the Sierra Nevada Brewing Coast Backcountry Series. And um, we are, I think, three um, sessions in. We had David Goodman talking about the best places to go in the Northeast. We had Marco talking about how to get started. And tonight we have Matt talking all about going uphill, um, the history of it, how to get into it, and what you need to know. Um, I met Matt years ago, and I'm so excited that he is part of this. Um, he's done all sorts of skiing all over the East Coast and is a writer for the New York Ski Blog. So super, definitely an expert in this area. Um, before we jump in, a few rules for everyone. Um, I am gonna be the moderator tonight, so I'll be in the chat. Um, feel, feel free to like introduce yourself, say where you're coming from, how, you know, how into backcountry skiing you've gotten so far, if you're just a beginner, if you've been on a few tours, um, but be kind to one another. Um, we just don't tolerate any sort of um, intolerance. So I will be there uh, kind of just patrolling and uh, feel free to say hi. And then with that, the only other thing I wanted to add is that Matt will be answering questions at the end. So feel free to drop your questions at any point during the talk, but just know like if he's not answering them, it's just because he hasn't seen them. I'm gonna hop on at the end and actually ask him them, but get them in the chat now so we make sure that, um, that they get asked. And with that, those are all my announcements. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, here is Matt. Hey, hey. Sorry, off, off to a rocky start. I think I was muted there. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, I really love to ski uphill. I'm happy to share it with everybody. It's uh, such a big world and there are so many different ways to enjoy skiing that I, I just uh, think that everyone should find what's right for them. And this is the best way to uh, stay in shape, ski fresh snow, have fun with your friends. I, I just love it. So I'm gonna jump in. This is me, I'm Matt Lucas. You can find me on Instagram at Petzl Logic, and I write for the New York Ski Blog and uh, for 10 years or something. Uh, it's a nice little community there. So let's see, you're here to learn about skinny. Uh, oh, a little more about me. Uh, I was a guide for Brooklyn Outfitters. Um, that was based in New York City. Took people out all over the East, hiking, skiing, climbing, all kinds of things. Um, ah, it is important, my first uh, experience skinning. I took, um, I took a break from skiing because I decided um, it was expensive and I wasn't really into skiing resorts. And I, I don't know how exactly, I wish I could explain it, that in like 2005, I was like, I, I figured out that like free cheese were like a binding that existed. And anyway, I bought some stuff off eBay and I left my job in Midtown and drove to New Hampshire, arriving like after dark. And I skinned up to Hermit Lake with like 85 pounds on my back and, uh, and slept out there in a lean-to and then went up and hiked up Tuckerman and like did the whole thing. And no one gave me any information about this. And I mean, I didn't die, but I almost died on the way down because uh, not on the way down, <laughs> skiing just on the on the way down hiking back to the car because i was so tired i don't know why i thought it was a good idea to hike with like 85 pounds worth of stuff i had like my whole apartment there like just in case like uh something came up i have no idea why so anyway i uh i improved since then so you're, you're benefiting from my wisdom of 15 years of not doing that and i've been to the adirondacks whites gaspazi and quebec and taking my area and my wilderness first uh, um, responder. And now I live in Canada. So there's an A there. Uh, most days, 52, 30 plus seasons are an awful lot. Best season, the one in which I had the most fun. And I love adding all these like little ski areas to my resume. So I've been to 79, mostly tiny little ski areas at this point. 
which are super fun. All right, so uh, part of the joy of skinning uphill is that you get to ski down some cool stuff. And uh, here's a picture of my brother skiing in Quebec with me in 2018. So uh, that was a nice day. And as you can see, his backpack does not contain 85 pounds worth of stuff. Um, the cool thing about talking about skinning is that we're really talking about the history of skiing. Um, skiing kind of started in various ways, like in different places, like all over the globe. Um, here are some people like snowboarding in Turkey and this was just, uh, this ha happened thousands of years ago. Um, although we give credit to everything, of course, like as being invented in the West, it's kind of not exactly true. Like we call it Nordic, but here they are sort of snowboarding. Um, here is a skier in Russia who, um, is really better dressed than I've ever been. But um, if you look at his skis, it's not that dissimilar from like kind of equipment that we would use, even though it's like handmade. I can see the guy in the back, his toes are locked in and he's got like a nice rocker on his skis there, which is good for like, you know, powder or just like getting through fresh snow on the flats. Um, but yeah, it does come back to like Western Europe for us because we call it Nordic. Um, the disciplines that they used for their daily life um, in Nordic style skiing uh, became like the basis for like the Winter Olympics, like whether you're talking about um, ski jumping, cross country skiing, or biathlon, like they, they relate to like their daily life, like they had to ski and hunt in winter and skinning and cross-country skiing is like how you get over the snow um and from place to place without like sinking down up to your waist because like doing that is no fun at all and skiing is actually really fun um like i go back and i look at these guys and i see like a smile on his face and they've been doing this in a traditional way for a couple thousand years like why is it such a leap to think that maybe people 2000 years ago weren't also doing this for fun? Like, I, I can't, I can't see it. Like no way that they like would only say like, Oh, got to drop something off the neighbors and like not go out for fun. Well, these guys, I don't know. They're maybe they're not having as much fun with their spears and stuff, but uh, these guys, they're having fun. So um, yeah, I made a comment about their like equipment. Um, these are some handmade skis also from Russia. And the, uh, obviously like we're doing some different stuff now in, in factories, but like the toes are locked in, the heels are free. They have big shovels to get through the snow. And uh, the tools are not like totally dissimilar to what we have. Um, but, you know, getting back to it, like we call it skinning because the main difference is uh, between like the, the downhill winter Olympic style sports and what we're talking about are the fact that uh, we can use skins on the bottom of the skis to get uphill. Um, the name came from the seal skins that uh, people would hunt and then use the spy product of to attach the bottoms of their skis so they could go uphill without expending a lot of energy. Like, um, with a herringbone, which is sort of like a V-shaped step that you can do to like get up the hill on your alpine skis. Maybe you've tried it or um, what I was talking about before, post holing. like if you ever just try to like trudge through the snow, it takes a lot of energy and it's not, it's certainly not fun. Um, wouldn't want to do it every day to get around. So, um, you know, like how I figured this out in 2005 that I wanted to like skin and like go and do backcountry or whatever. Um, it wasn't a new idea even then. Um, this was the uh, title slide from the Telemark movie, which was 1987, I think. Um, these uh, Telemarkers were like the first guys who said like, we wanna get outside of the resorts 
Um, we want to go ski like cool peaks. We see the peaks that we want to ski like off in the distance from the resorts. Like, what do we have to do to that? Um, and some of them were just kind of like, hey, like the cross country gear, we can like get uphill on that. And the downhill gear, we can ski anything we want. Like, obviously, in the 80s, you have like stiff boots and like, you know, cool skis that were probably like 220 centimeters long. So they could like, jump off cliffs or whatever. Um, we've come a long way since then. But they, they pieced it together and they uh, started making like cross country style gear out of like beefier plastic equipment. And they reinvented skins with uh, polyester so they didn't have to sacrifice like cute animals. And um, yeah, it, it, uh, it was really boring. Uh, like the, the whole pursuit of like wild snow and, and skiing for exercise and not being locked into the resorts. And it's just evolved since then. Um, basically, like if you guys are here and you want to learn about skinning, like there's only uh, there, there's a few pieces of gear basically you need to use that are like more specific to this discipline than um, being out in a resort. Uh, I put some arrows here. I hope it's clear enough, but um, the boots are like ski boots, but they have a walk mode in the back, so you can flip between ski and walk. Uh, the bindings allow your heel to be free, so you can walk uphill um, without the, I don't know, I assume everyone mostly skis, but you could see it wouldn't be that much fun with your heel locked to like pick up a whole ski. Um, the skins have these nice tail loops, so uh, you can loop on a skin onto the front of the ski and onto the back and, and push your way uphill. And um, you have adjustable poles, which are not totally necessary if you want to skip somewhere, but they do make it a little nicer and, and uh, away you go. And I'll point out here too, that his technique is pretty good. He's, uh, you know, or her. She's uh, keeping her skis on the ground. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to pick up your gear. You're sort of pulling it uphill, making a nice, pleasant, long stride on reasonably not steep slopes. I'll get into the technique a little bit later. But um, I have this slide here, my friend Dan here. Um, just some reasons, like why skin? Well. I mentioned exercise. Yeah, you burn a lot of calories when you like hike up mountains and it's like zero degrees. Um, it keeps you warm too. Fun with friends, choose your own adventure. Like the, like I love organizing a tour where like you ski up to some hill, ski down the back, go up another hill, ski back down to your car. And like you've seen vistas from like a couple different places. Uh, legendary powder, of course. And this year, COVID restrictions. Like, there are a lot of resorts and other places where you can just roll up and you can ski and you're on your own and you don't have to worry about like being in a lift line. I, I don't have to explain that to you guys. I'm sure everyone's pretty aware of what's going on in the world. Um, if, uh, if not, then you should see what else the internet is good for because there's a lot of info on there. But, uh, this does bring us to the next slide, which is about gear. Um, you know, the, we're lucky to have so many options, basically. Um, there are just a lot of different ways to get up the hill, and it sort of depends on what your goals are, how much money you want to spend. And if I haven't pointed out already, if I go back, like Dan is on a splitboard here, so this isn't just for skiers. Like um, if you want to snowboard or you think snowboarding looks cool, then get a splitboard, learn to snowboard. Uh, the mountains are for everybody. You know, there's, there's more than one way to get up. There's more than one way to get down. Um, let me just see. Yeah, I like it so much. I'm looking at this picture and I'm just remembering that like we were out there on this sunny day and these chickadees were like, in the trees and just how many nice experiences I've had that like where I've turned a corner and there's been a moose or a woodpecker like right on the ground, just like looking at me or a 
ptarmigan or, you know, something. And it just wouldn't happen at a resort. So I, I left that out, but I just think that um, if you like being outside, you like the quiet, it's, uh, it's definitely a different experience, but it's just got a lot of value. Back to gear. Um, here's my buddy, Zach. Um, Zach is dropping a knee somewhere. We're skiing at sunset. I'm sure we have headlamps and everything. Uh, you know, again, there's just more than one way to do it. So, uh, telemarking is just another. So the important thing is that you have some way to get up the hill with your heel free. And I think that's what everything basically like has in common. Um, if you guys haven't heard of uh, telemarking already, it's, it is kind of like a throwback to the original way of skiing that I was saying before. And there are places that if you think it looks fun to you to like do this and like really get down in the powder, it is a serious advantage. Um, it's just fun. And you can take a lesson at like Matterberg Land or Platakale, those places sort of cater to telemarkers a little more and um, give it a try. So for the rest of us that aren't split borders, that aren't um, telemarkers, this was sort of like where people used to get started skinning. And uh, as you can see, this is like a frame that would sit inside your Alpine bindings. And these things weighed like a couple pounds each. They were called Alpine Trekkers or like Day Wreckers, if you wanted to be cheeky about it. And they were really heavy, but people were into it. And uh, the gear kept improving. You can see these Silverettas. This replaced like the um, Alpine binding portion and then you didn't need the frame insert anymore. You could just stick your toe right in here and away you go. They didn't ski too well. So at some point, uh, someone said, hey, what else could we do with this to make it better? And these guys over in Austria, Dinafit, um, they were like, well, what if we just connected the toes to um, the boots with a couple pins and the heel, we could make it free if it just like spins around. Um, well, that was a really good idea actually, because this, this design has been around for a long time and it's uh, barely improved upon in, in some ways, depending on what your goals are. So um, one of the ways that people have improved on it are with bindings like this. There's uh, a Solomon Shift or a Marker Duke PT. And basically what they do is, um, it's difficult to see here, but they have pins for going up and the heel gets out of the way. And when you go to ski down, the pins disappear and you have a regular Alpine toe and a regular Alpine binding. So that is a nice compromise where you get like the full efficiency of a modern binding with all the releasability to protect your, you know, uh, meniscus and everything without the disadvantage of like the original stuff where you would take this out before you ski down. Oh. I guess I have a slide here about uh, snowboarding too. Uh, they did want to get in on the fun. And as you can see here, this is an old video from Vuale, which makes um, skis and other gear. And some of the gear they made were for uh, snowboard bindings. So you could make your own split board. Fortunately, I think uh, manufacturers have gotten in the business. So um, there's, there's no need for you to uh, attach your snowboard do a couple saw horses and and saw it down the middle before hoping to piece it back together again this would be like a modern one and as you can see it is much cleaner um i actually saw an article just yesterday about <laughs> about split borders this is a maybe a reason to to start splitboarding for somebody. Splitboarders who like to ski down sometimes just for the fun of it, you know, if they don't feel like snowboarding, um, which I thought was pretty hilarious because you know snowboarding in fresh snow is also a lot of fun. But hey, like I said, there's a million ways to get up and down, so whatever looks cool to you. Um, 
anyway, like the general arc of everything was uh, the gear went from like very primitive and heavy and limited for compatibility and for features and everybody sort of just like iterated on this for decades until there were like better ways to, to get up and down. Um, if you ever have a chance, I don't know how many of you are in New York, but you can go to Hunter Mountain. There's a little lodge at the summit and in the walls there at like the little warm up lodge, there's like basically a full museum for all the history of skis till like 1980 something. And um, there are some touring versions that like, I couldn't even find slides for because they're like so bizarre with these like weird bars that go up your knees and everything. But um, if you're ever there, it's super worth checking out. They don't even advertise it. And I think it's like one of the most unique things. But um, yeah, uh, like I guess, I should, if anyone is interested uh, in purchasing gear, I really like stuff like this because it's so simple. Um, so for me, in some ways, this was like the peak of all the engineering, but I could really understand why somebody would want something like this. Um, a binding, like the what they call low-tech pins, like you don't really have an ISO certified DIN release value there's some like guesswork and, and voodoo and dark magic and everything. Um, so it takes a little bit of time to, uh, to dial everything in, but there's less to break, there's less weight. So you can just spend more of your time and energy like skiing. And I think that gets back a little bit too to like what I didn't know about taking the kitchen sink up to Mount Washington is that like things that make a difference in your day are like, packing appropriately, working on your technique. Um, and if you're skinning efficiently and you're not carrying everything, maybe you get an extra lap or maybe you're just able to ski a little better and a little more in control because skiing with a pack is like really different than like skiing at a resort where you just like whip right down with your jacket. It's a different experience. Um, this by the way is uh, Angel Slides. Um, in the Adirondacks, and you can see that these were ripped out by um, landslides, and they also avalanche, and those are other concerns. But you know, when you get them right, they can also provide like a really fun ski experience, and it's it's cool to know that we have stuff like this in the east. You know, you don't necessarily have to like get on a plane and go the other side of the world to go do something like really cool. Um, speaking of the gear, this is like one of the first boots that sort of made a difference on the market. The, the Garmont, they were bought by Scott. So Scott boots are kind of like Garmont's now. These are 20 years old. You're not going to find these in stores. Um, if anyone is getting gear, I would just tell them to get what fits like, and keep your goals in mind. Like, this boot didn't have pins in the toe for some reason, or um, maybe someone knew that they were going to use like a frame style binding to get up and down. So if you know a little bit about what you want to do, you're going to be able to match your goals maybe a little better in the store, but you know, there's only so much they can do to like make a boot fit your foot. And if you're miserable and getting blisters, like you're not going to have a good time. So try on a lot of stuff. This is what I have now. You can see uh, the buckles are almost like non-existent. They're just like a little bit of steel cables. So they're pretty lightweight and the range of motion is like gotten way better than what this was. So that means that when you put your boot in walk mode, the back can articulate farther back so you can get like a longer stride and you're not fighting your boot to get up the hill, which is pretty cool. So everybody get my boots. No, don't, don't get low fits. I promise you'll have more fun. Um, this is a slide to talk about skins. As you can see, my brother is struggling here. Um, it's pretty funny. I don't know if he's here today, but I'm using him as an example. I had his nice skiing earlier, and uh, now I'm looking at this, and I'm like, his skinning technique is terrible, and he's using his poles totally improperly. But uh, what I'm supposed to be talking about are the skins. And um, 
skins are all made out of like polyester and or unless you want to get the original seals um i bet those are heavy and maybe a little gross but uh anyway i don't know where to get them so i can't help you out but um the polyester ones you're talking about like a backing material that faces the you're talking about the part that faces the snow and you're talking about a backing material that goes on top of that and then on top of that sandwich is something that sticks to the bottom of your skis or snowboard and um they've all gotten pretty good with the glued versions so if there's glue that's going to face your base they're all pretty good i think that the g3s maybe the glue isn't as good and then what else you'll see is like some of them say like they're mohair or mohair mix like um if anyone's writing this down or if you have questions like the mohair is like made to give you the best glide um when you're starting out you don't care about glide the most you care about like the uh the ascent like you don't want to be sliding back so i would tell anyone new to stay away from mohair get a mohair mix because that's like you know supposed to be good for everything or um just the regular ones and then you won't look like this trying to get up like a short bit of like steep slope um that's my buddy alan standing on top he's like a mountain goat so basically you just can't catch him i don't know what he has but he's always the fastest even though he's like 60 years old just can never catch him um there are also these uh other skins called glue lists that i guess i alluded to um i've had mixed results with them i'm just trying to like i know it's kind of a lot but i just i don't want anyone to like waste their time um the snowpack in the east, I don't know where everybody's from, can contain like a lot of water content. And I found with them at the time, this is probably going back to like 2014-ish, if I did try to do more than two laps somewhere, the skins would pick up water. And then once the surface with the tack that faces the back of the skis, um, picked up a little bit of water. They are very hard to keep on your skis and that would pretty much ruin your day because once you don't have skins to go up the hill, then you have to walk up it, which is uh, post holing or you're just gonna have a bad time. You basically have to ski back to your car. So um, yeah, I really like plain skins. Like, I guess people will always try to like sell you like on something else, but if you have the plain, plain skins to go up with glue, that's just going to work. Like you're going to have a good time and then you can like throw it in your backpack and you just keep going. Um, the only thing that, that you should know is that if you take out your skins at the end of the day, make sure that you like, you put them in your back, uh, you take them out of your backpack and you give them like some air so they can really dry out at the end. And when I'm done with the season, I just face them on each other. So the glue is just sticks to the other glue and they last for years. It's really cool because, um, you know, so much of gear is always trying is, is companies trying to sell you like the best stuff every year. But I, for whatever reason, like skins, they got kind of right. And, like brands like Black Diamond and Pomoka are just doing such a great job and they last forever. And, you know, assuming you don't like cut them on something, I think it's pretty cool when that happens. So, okay, you're all geared up. This is not, I'm not saying you should take your books, by the way. Don't take your books skinny. I talked about that. The 85 pound backpack doesn't work, but um, you're geared up. You want to go skinning, you got a backpack, you got your skis or split board, you have touring miming skins, your poles, and bam, where do I go? Well, this is one place that I like to go. This is um, in Quebec. I mean, it's not even that close to me because it's so far east, but there's some mountains called the Chick Chocks and you can get way out there and you can see these like big alpine bowls in the back and it's really fun um you know not a lot of people around but um what's cool now is that you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to skin and have a good time um most of the resorts are pretty familiar with skinners and they have policies that are like explicitly stated and they're probably not going to throw snowballs at you when you try to go uphill um some places that i've been like mohawk mountain in connecticut 
they couldn't have been friendlier. Like I asked to like, if I needed to buy like an uphill ticket or anything to, to go to the top and they said, no, have a great day. Tell everybody about it. So I am No, I'm just, uh, that, that is basically what happened. They were like, if you want, you can stop by and get a burger in the lodge. And I did that and it was delicious too. So now, you know, this might've changed um, since then, like the sport is getting so much more popular. Um, so some places do have like specific hours. Um, other places you're just prohibited, like Hunter has specific hours. I can't recall. I think you have to be like, going down at nine or something. I don't know. Catamount, they told me on a beautiful powder day, like not to do it. They were just like, no, we don't want people doing that here. So um, anyway, the cool thing is, is that because of it, it's so popular, um, I put together a couple of resources that I'm going to drop in the chat at the end. So um, just websites I found that make it a lot easier to keep this in the back of your head. Uh, yeah, so here's another little place that I like to scan. As you can see, like, this isn't like a huge peak or anything, but it was pretty steep. The trees were spaced perfectly. I loved it. Um, the most important thing is to like get comfortable with yourself, with your equipment, to know your goals, to know your partner, to be responsible, like this is a little hill, but I was pretty far off the trailhead and I don't think I was going to see anybody. So if somebody, if something happened, um, if I caught a tip on a tree or uh, if there was an avalanche or who knows, like, yeah, you, you're like kind of on your own. It's a, it's a wilderness experience sometimes if you do something like this. Um, so it's important to know like your abilities and uh, your gear, basically. Um, I didn't make a slide for it, but I also did want to emphasize the fact that like knowing yourself and your gear and your partners, like that is all stuff that you can like really get a handle of like at a local resort or like going to Harriman when there's snow like there is now or whatever, you know, um, it makes such a difference. But anyway, I think this is Lionel, Linus, is that his name? I liked the peanuts when I was a kid. Anyway, um, you gotta practice, like everything is a matter of practice. Um, just getting in the habit of things, like putting your, putting your skins and taking them off, like, there are cool tricks you can do. Like if you're on skis, you don't have to take your skis all the way off to pull your skins. And that like saves you a step and it prevents you from getting snow in your pants. But, um, but it, whatever you're going to do, it's like just about getting good with the routine. So you like, you know, put your boots in walk mode for the way up. Um, you take long strides and you keep your skis on the snow. So you're not lifting up the whole ski, you shorten up, uh, your stance a little bit and put your skis up when it's steeper. Um, a lot of people will set like skin tracks that that go like straight up the mountains and there's really no reason to do that. You're just gonna burn yourself out. So, you know, you can use a switchback. Think about it, it's, it's just like when you're hiking. Like, I don't know how many people of you have done um, like uh, the Devil's Path and the Catskills. Like those hiking trails are steep and, you know, thank God, they don't make hiking trails like that anymore. Like you want to like make hiking trails that have like switchbacks so they don't get like totally eroded and everything. Um, anyway, um, on your on your heels, like after you get them out of the way so you can free heel up, you'll probably have like a riser. If it's um, on your split board, it's underneath your, your heel. And if it's under skis, you'll probably rotate it or flip it down. Um, don't waste too much time with that stuff. Like I like to, what was that commercial? Like set it and forget it. Like if you're on the top level, it's cause you're going up something really steep. Like you want to get it on that middle riser and you just want to like keep on trucking and enjoying the views. Um, yeah, you, you want to like make sure that you read the terrain well, that you get your fitness up. Like, I, I don't know, like I, I try to like, 
do stuff now just to make sure that I'm like, at least going out for walks, you know, we have like, um, not much going around, going on in Montreal for like businesses and reasons to leave your house these days. But like, I just can't stress it enough. Like how much having like general, general fitness helps that probably should have been my last tip, but I have another one here. Um, side hailing. That's when you're cutting across a slope on your switchback. Um, you can roll your ankles down a little bit and just try to make sure that you have like good skin contact um, against the snow. I'm sure I'm forgetting a million things, but like that's going to keep you like getting uphill and you're going to feel good about that. Um, so you got to the top and you're ready to fly. Um, you got to put your helmet back on. Uh, like I said, like even if you're at a resort or whatever, nobody nobody wants to be dealing with a, a head injury. Uh, goggles on. Uh, I made these notes here. Like, put on your warmer gloves. Like, you actually stay so warm when you're skinning up that it's you forget about it, and you um, you can lose all your heat, especially like on a summit. If you turn the corner the wrong way, and like the wind starts hitting you at 60 miles an hour, like all that heat will evaporate pretty fast. So um, sometimes it's smart not to do like a full transition at the top. Like you can put on like your down at tree line if you can see the summit and then get up there and you're going to stay warmer. But uh, make sure your boots are back in ski mode. Look over your partner. Have your partner look over you. And then like have a fun ride. And um, when you're skiing down, like especially like – resort, backcountry, whatever, you guys are getting used to it. You're like a team. You have to like stop, look over your shoulder, make sure that you're like having a good like partner experience. Like it's skiing can be so low, but like when you're with people, like they depend on you and you're going to depend on them. So, uh, you know, I guess it's just not like necessarily like in the movies all the time. Etiquette. Ah, more peanuts. Cool um follow the rules of the resorts like there are a lot of places to go but there are not going to be a lot of places to go if uh, we lose access um because people can't behave properly and then i'll be all like this is why we can't have nice things and people will say well matt said no please like uh it's it's such a cool sport and we're in a great moment for it but it would be a shame if it started to slide the other way, because people got sick of Skinners. So um, uh, stay to the side of any trails. Uh, just let faster skiers ski by. Like if you're going up at a nice pace, like some people are out there, they're going to be like in spandex and stuff and racing uphill with their like, um, you know, road bike glasses and everything. And they're going to look like Spider-Man, you know, just like throwing their webs right past you. And, just let them go by. They don't. They don't want to be behind you, and you don't want them around. Probably, uh, you know, trace. Obviously, um, parking. Parking is a major problem. Like right now, we got this crazy storm going on. You don't know if uh, the lots are all going to get plowed or plowed that well. So, try to do your part to like limit the space that you're taking up. Um, I didn't mention this here, but I guess I will. Just because now it's snowing, I know everyone's like really excited about it. I keep uh, a metal snow shovel in my car all the time because like if you're doing backcountry skinning, like you might end up someplace on a trailhead somewhere in the Adirondacks and if it snows all day and they don't plow the lot or something, like it's not fun to be stuck. So um, I should probably add that, but, but metal shovel in the car and also uh, some cables in case someone needs a jump or something. Uh, let's see what else. Never walk in a skin track. Um, it's not fun. Like the skin tracks are like so nice when people ski up the same way. As long as you're, they're not too steep, like you're going to stick to them. And those grooves will keep you so you can look around. Like this, your skis won't fly out from side to side. Um, it's just a really pleasant experience. So if there's a direction to, to skin in, you just follow it. And uh, my last note here is that dogs can impact wildlife and other people's experience. They say that it's bad for them and you. Like, obviously, like, you know, dogs are super cute and everything. And 
they love the snow and it's cute to like watch them tunnel around through it. But um, not all dogs are like made to be out in the snow for like long, long periods of time. And um, they sort of have to be trained to like go skinning with you. Like I've seen a lot of dogs that get tired and they like step on your skis or snowboards. So they could take a break from post holing because unfortunately they haven't made skins yet for skis for dogs. Um, and that can be really bad for them. It's also really bad if they like stop in front of you. And I've, I've heard stories about uh, people taking their dogs skinning and they stop in front of them and then the skier has to like stop short and metal edges and a 200 pound body and a tiny dog leg, it, it can be really bad. So um, I'd urge people to be really careful about where they're going, especially if they don't have a lot of experience with their taking around wild winter. Um, most people would just, unfortunately, like kind of ignore that advice. And there's other aspects of that too, with, you know, annoying property owners or just having like uh, dog poop in the skin track and, you know, whatever. But I guess that's like anything. It's my friend, Brian, skiing some pal. Um, yeah, so uh, you see, he's got this bright orange backpack. Um, I talked about the routine a little bit about like when you get to the top and taking off your light gloves and your skinning in so you can put on your warm stuff. Like your backpack is also like that. It's like nice to have a ritual with, with your backpack like the day before. Um, make sure that you have like the right amount of lunch and snacks, uh, water. Um, I like to have food that I can snack on constantly because I think I said before, you can burn so many calories. Like if you do a Mount Washington day or something, like that's like, it could be like three and a half hours uphill to the summit with like all your stuff. And it's cold, like you, you really need a lot of calories to stay warm. So um, I usually have that stuff in my pockets and then I have the other stuff in the backpack. Um, you have to be careful with all your gear, like, cause you depend on all this stuff. Um, so I never, you never skin in your helmet really because you'll get too hot. Like, I don't know, I see people doing stuff like that. It just doesn't make any sense. Like they're not gonna have a good time. So um, I guess the practice comes into it, but like, yeah, like your helmet might, your goggles might feel like really cool when you're like at the resort and you like flip it up and have it on your forehead for like the lift rides or something. But if you do that when you're skinning, like you're gonna be breathing on them the whole time and they're gonna freeze up and you're not gonna be able to see anything on the way down. Um, it's just really like, it's not fun. So that's advice, but also I guess it comes with practice. Uh, you have to work on your like layers, getting your like pit zips and whatever else like going so you can be like, stay, stay cool on the way up and then get all your stuff going so you're warm again. I don't know. It, part of me feels like most of touring is just managing like what you'll need and like anticipating what you're gonna need next. And if it's neither of those things, if you don't need it now and you don't need it next, like maybe it can stay in the car. Um, but then you do have to like plan for emergencies. Like if you if your skins fail, like it's nice to have like voile straps or duct tape so you can just like roll it right on the skis and make sure that your day isn't ruined. Like if you have to get up and over something so you get back to your car or something, or, you know, if you're, um, if some of your stuff gets wet, like, cause you, it's that kind of day and there's a lot of powder, then maybe it's a great idea to have like extra socks or um, an underlayer, something like that. So you don't like get soaking wet and really cold. Um, here's my brother again. I guess these pictures are a little stretched out. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, we, we ran out of the skin track. It got too steep. And anyway, uh, yeah, skiing, skiing powder. So um, tomorrow, a lot of people are going to be like hiking at resorts and closed resorts and in the parks. And there are just so many places to go. Um, I don't, again, know where everyone's from, but like I, I lived in New York City for my whole life until I moved here. I just had a great time like going to Catskills and skiing places and in Vermont and in New Hampshire and 
I went to West Virginia to ski when it snowed there and Pennsylvania. And there were all these things like once you start like looking at the mountains like a little differently, you're like, oh, I could like go up and ski that power line or something. And it's like, maybe I'll be the first person to do it. No one will care that you're the first person to do it. But I still think it's kind of cool. I'll care. I'll care if you do that. Um, yeah, there's just like stuff all over, like especially like closed areas. I know that Jeremy Davis is going to be speaking about Nelsap soon um, with Happy Hour. And that's a whole product he started like in the year 2000 about like former uh, New England ski areas that went out of business for one reason or another. Some some came back, like uh, Magic Mountain in Vermont, which is an awesome place, was closed for a few years. And fortunately, skiers loved it enough to, to allow it to open again. Um, but there are places like in Harriman at Silvermine that you can ski, or like you can go to like Hogsback in Vermont, which is like really a nice place to ski and the lot is open. Or uh, you can go out west and just ski like Birth of Pass, which was like the biggest ski area like ever. Um, but it closed for some reason and now it's like kind of run by volunteers. It's like a free place to go. Um, all these places have like different things to know about, like at a certain point, like uh, Birth and Pass is very much like a real big mountain. So you start to talk about other dangers more than just like being cold or not getting back to the car. You have like avalanches there. So that sort of takes me into my next slide. Um, there have been a lot of avalanches lately in Utah. And I think that People are pretty aware out there, but you can see that awareness doesn't necessarily translate to like making good decisions all the time. So um, if you are planning on skiing very wild places, then uh, it's probably something that would you should look into like getting an education about. Um, there are avalanche forecasting services all over the, the US and world. Um, this one is, this slide is from Mount Washington, New Hampshire. Uh, here, when I took the clip, the avalanche rating was low for all aspects, but uh, there was a recent human triggered avalanche in Left Gully, which is, you know, something I've skied and certainly not something I want to like take a long slide down. And like I said, it, there are other dangers. There's the avalanches, there are tree wells, there's not getting back the car. You know, it, it sort of all just depends on your goals. So. Like, like I've been stressing, it's, it's nice to like ease in, figure out what your goals are, practice with your gear, take it from there. Like you don't have to go out and do like the biggest, baddest thing um, day one, which which I guess I did. And like I, I guess I said, maybe I should finish the story. I did not make it home that night. Um, I couldn't, I fell asleep in the car. I woke up and drove to Boston rather than New York where I had a friend and I slept for another 12 hours. I was so wiped out. And that's probably uh, the most dangerous thing most people will do is uh, get in the car. And certainly after a day of skiing, it's like something to think about. So these guys, they're, they're done with their day. Um, hot tub time machine, I think that took place in the ski resort. So uh, get your skins out of the bag to save the glue. Um, and rest your weary legs because you had a big day. And uh, maybe you want to know where to go, like for, for future adventures. You have uh, Mount Washington, talked about that plenty. There are hut to hut trips, which are both like extreme and mellow. Um, you could do like uh, the Colorado 10th Mountain Division huts and just go from place to place. That was named after 10th Mountain Division who fought in World War II and brought skiing, basically, and popularized it in the US. There are roots in France, there are roots in BC, there are roots in Quebec, and these are like huts that you can like ski to, and it'll totally change your like whole um, vision of like what skiing could be. The Adirondacks, uh, the next few are like maintained sites, so they're not that wild, and they're really fun with like trees, like Rasta in Vermont, and Granite Backcountry Alliance, and you FQME, and you can get involved in them and like help them maintain the woods um, and expand. Like they're really cool organizations that are making like skinning just so accessible. 
And if you're into the fitness side, um, you can also race doing this. Like a race could be like two laps up a mountain, like first to the top and bottom and whatever. Uh, super fun. That's one last one to me, I guess, coming down to Kuwar somewhere in Quebec. Um, thank you guys for listening. I hope you learned anything, something, <laughs> anything. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check out these comments and uh, Sarah can chime in if she has any. All else. right. Hello, I'm back. Um, that was awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I feel like there's so much in there and I'm still on those like initial historic skiing photos. They were amazing. <laughs> Um, okay, so a few notes before we hop into questions. The first is I've gotten a few emails that not everyone can comment on the mapyr.org page. So I'm very sorry about that. If you are watching and you have a question, you're not able to comment, the best thing that you can do right now is go over to the MapYR Facebook page or the MapYR YouTube and you will be able to comment there and we'll be able to see your question. So I do apologize for that. We'll look into it. Um, we do want to hear your questions, it's not personal. All right, second thing um, is we actually had a good quote from Ari on Facebook or a good comment that there are some recent changes to uphill policies. And I shared some links in the chat um, that I guess have outdated ones. And he's suggesting there's a Facebook group called Ski Resort Uphill Access. So it sounds like maybe those that website had some a little bit of outdated information. Um, so maybe double check before you go do uphill at resorts. Uh, and those are my only two notes. <laughs> um, all right, Matt, you ready for some questions? Sure. Okay, cool. Oh, I do have one more note. So with all of this, um, I know there's the, some of these questions are gonna be about safety. As Matt mentioned, like this is not a replacement for you getting um, an area education, taking an avalanche course and all of that stuff. Um, so please uh, know that and invest in your uh, long-term education for safety. But um, you know, Matt can also share what he does uh, as well. So with that, um, well, let's start with the safety question. Matt, sure. this is from Sue. What are some good safety tips someone might not think of? Uh, my best is always to tell someone responsible where you're going in and coming out and what time. Yeah, that that's a great tip. Um, I think that like uh, backcountry skiing and following like uh, any sort of hiking protocol like that makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't have any specific tips that I that I didn't that I don't think I already mentioned. I'm I'm really sorry about that. I think that um, in the east, most of the incidents I've heard about are about people getting lost. So if uh, if you wanted to, I know avalanches like uh, are such a, they're very, very spooky. Um, but the reality is like people like could probably brush up on like map and compass and making a plan like how they're gonna like go about their day and how they're gonna get back to their car. Um, it makes such a big difference. You know, it, it's just more fun to like, not get lost in the woods or have that extra stress about like, oh man, why didn't I put a new battery in my headlamp? And we've all been there and it, it's not fun. So um, definitely like the research beforehand and like making sure you're prepared is the best. Cool. All right, another safety question um, or related. What's your go-to preference for uh, testing out snowpack before dropping in on questionable or just everyday touring terrain? Okay, um, most of my uh, my skinning is very mellow. Like I like to go have fun with my friends. Like we we skin up at like closed resorts. There's no avalanche danger. It's really about exercise. Um, and yeah, it doesn't get the headlines. Like everyone wants to like watch like ski movies and stuff. And it's not, I, I know I've got this slide up here right now of me going down that cool bar, but like those aren't most of my ski days. Um, so I think that you know, I'd be doing everyone a disservice to like try to replace like an area education. Like I do my things that, that I learned there. So I can't really sum it up like in, in a few seconds. Yeah. Um, okay. And do you use a sat phone for emergencies? 
I don't, but I'm really tempted to like uh, to look into that. They, the technology looks so cool for emergencies, um, and just being able to like send people. Like I've had them out on trips. Like I went to Katahdin. I wish I put some slides up from that. Um, we camped out for a few days. I did some really really cool skiing there. Um, and one of the people in the group was able like to send the text message at night to his partner saying that everything was fine. And it was really like a nice level of safety. We were, you're like 18, 19 miles in from the nearest road and that nearest road is only trafficked by like truckers there. So it was like really remote. And um, yeah, we, I'm glad, you know, nothing happened, but uh, it was nice. Cool, all right, now we have some gear questions. Sure. So first one, what is what is mohair? I think mohair is a natural fiber that they mix in with the polyester. Um, so it's it's not like a, a vegan friendly option, but it's supposed to, just talking about the skiing and not the ethics, it's supposed to um, give you like a really nice glide. So when you push off from one ski and start to glide on the other, like you would in cross country, um, you get a you get a lot of glide that makes you go faster, basically. Like when you're trying to like cover distance, um, and going faster and saving energy means you can have a longer day, basically. Yeah, cool. And then um, types of glue. Any comments and how to uh, best reglue? And then the second part of that question is: Can reglue be done in the field if skins are not sticking, or can it only be done indoors at room temperature? Um, there's, I can just take that one easier. As far as I know, there's no way to re-glue in the field. Um, but that's why I have Wally straps. That's why I keep uh, duct tape on my poles. Um, it's actually like, a, that's, a, that's a really neat trick. I don't know if anyone's ever talked about that, but um, I'll take a roll of duct tape and I'll unspool like the lead end and I'll start wrapping it around my ski poles and the water bottles and it just sits there for years at a time sometimes but then when I need it it actually works fine so I was out with a split border the other day and he had catastrophic skin failure we were on the wrong side from the car and we were able to get his skins back so he didn't have to do like a long trudge through the snow yeah it's so smart it's actually like I always have duct tape around my water bottle when I'm camping and I don't know why I wouldn't do the same thing with my poles, so. Oh yeah, definitely <laughs> added yeah. to it. Awesome. Um, oh, did I miss part of that too? Okay, re-gluing your skins, sorry. Oh yes. <laughs> um, the best thing you can do first, if your skins are dead, um, there's a there's a hack, you can search for it. It's called like the skin, skin refresh hack. You get out an iron and a brown paper bag and there's some video tutorials on it. And if you have like a lot of like pine needles and stuff like that in there, um, it'll take them out and maybe that'll give you an extra month. Maybe it'll give you an extra two seasons. Um, who knows? And then there are basically two other kinds of, uh, glue you could use. You could use, um, sheet glue where you like sort of, uh, trim it out and then iron it on, or there's stuff that comes in like a tube or a can. And, uh, it's a little more complicated and maybe not environmentally friendly. Cause I think these chemicals are pretty serious, but, um, uh, but it, at least it works for like a really long time. If you re-glue, like you're getting with a can, like you're gonna get a skin that lasts for another five years, so. Wow, cool. Um, okay, similar kind of question. What are best practices for maintaining and tuning bindings and skis? I'm an alpine skier, I know how to um, wax tune downhill ski bases, um, but this is specific for, for to a touring setup. Yeah, well, like I said, with the skins, definitely make sure that you take them off and hang them to dry because that's going to keep them in good shape. Um, the bindings, uh, if you're skiing like powder all day long, they're in the snow. You could be at a rust risk, especially like if you're used to just like treating your gear like really like uh, like it doesn't matter and just like throwing it in your car and like leaving it in the trunk for like weeks at a time. I would say like it's better to like really make sure that you knock off any loose snow before you do that and also bring it in your house so it can like dry out properly and um, there's like lithium grease that you could use for your dean fits and uh, sometime in the summer just make sure you give them a little bit of grease so they're like ready to go again the next year. 
cool. All right, last question. What do the certification alphabet letters stand for after your name? The certification alphabet letters after my name. Yeah, I don't know if I missed this on the slide. <laughs> Maybe, oh. yeah. Uh, I think uh, in the first first slide that there's the ARI, that's the Avalanche Institute. That was a trick question. I don't know what it stands for. They just they we don't know. Me, they taught me snow science. They were like, this is how you yeah. look at a snowflake under a microscope to see if it's going to yeah. happen, which they don't do in level one. Um, right. Well, that's a good segue to like, you can take ARI 1 and ARI 2, um, well, and ARI 3, I think, but ARI 1 for sure. Um, on the East Coast, up at Mount Washington, usually. Yeah, there. If you're interested, there's uh, Petra Cliffs in Burlington uh, teaches avalanche uh, courses. There's definitely courses in North Conway. There are courses all over. Uh, one guy I really like. His name is uh, Mark Chauvin, and he was the like international mountain guide of the year a couple of years ago. He's an older guy. He's uh, put up ice lines all over the Northeast. He really knows what he's talking about. And um, I would highly recommend him, but there are so many, so many good people teaching like avalanche classes these yeah. days. Yeah. The other one uh, was uh, wilderness first aid. Yeah. And that is about how to maybe patch up somebody and get them out if something bad happens in the woods, which is also a really nice experience and like a class that would be useful for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you're going anywhere outside of like the, golden hour, just really good skills, skill base to have. Cool. All uh, right. Any other questions? That's all, that's all I'm seeing. So any last words, Matt? Well, thank you all for, for coming. I hope you learned something and I hope everyone has a really fun day in the powder tomorrow. That's getting after it because I will be at work. <laughs> yeah, seriously. If you're going skiing this week, we're jealous. <laughs> yeah. So <it's> okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Sarah. Of course. Thanks for being here. Bye, everyone.